So this topic on data transmission, we have just one, one section left, channel capacity. And what we want to arrive at at the end of the lecture today is two different equations that show us a relationship between bandwidth, bandwidth of our link, and data rate, also called capacity. Channel, our communications channel or communications link, capacity is how fast we can send bits across that channel. So think of the capacity in terms of bits per second. So we'll see a relationship between bandwidth and data rate. But to do this, to understand this, we have to introduce one or two different concepts along the way. So it would take the whole, whole lecture. And the first concept is decibels. Hands up if you know about decibels. DB. Everyone's heard of DB, decibels? OK, simple. What's a decibel? Well, uh, we will see in communication systems that we use DB to measure systems, or measure, in particular, gain and loss of systems. So we need to explain a bit about decibels first. And I'll go through some first some simple examples. Um, for any system, whether it's communications, uh, almost any system where we have some input and output, we can look at the gain of that system. So a financial system. You go and invest a thousand baht in some uh, company. And then a week later you get return of 2,000 baht. What's your gain in that case? You start with 1,000 baht, you invest it, and a week later they give you some money, 2,000 baht. Your money plus another 1,000. How do you say, how much did you gain in that case? How much money did you gain? 1,000 baht? Okay, that's the absolute, how much money you gained, 1,000 baht. Now think of how much you gained relative to what you started with. Start with 1,000, end up with 2,000, what's your gain relative to the input? Sorry? 100%, okay, another way, correct, and another way you can look at it? Have you, you, so you're correct, but there's another way that we can describe, we could say, I doubled my money, okay? I start with 1,000, I come back with 2,000, I've doubled my money, which is really a factor of two, okay? That is, take the input, multiply by two, and I get what I received at the end. So we can say, that's one way to express the gain as some factor or as some ratio between the output and input. So in this system, I can say my gain is 2, or a factor of 2. Uh, I start with 1,000 baht, I invest it, and a week later I only get 250 baht back. What's my gain? I haven't, haven't been successful. What's my gain now? I've lost, I know, 750 baht, but from a relative perspective, what would I express the gain as? Any guess, attempts? Zero point two five. One quarter. I start with one thousand, end up with two hundred and fifty. That is, I've got a quarter of what I started with. So think about a multiplier. The end value is zero point two five times by my input value, my initial value. So that gain is the multiplier. In the first example, I start with 1,000, multiply by 2, the gain, I end up with 2,000 baht. In the second example, I started with 1,000, I multiply by 0.25, one quarter, and I end up with 250 baht. So that multiplier is the gain of the system. In this case, it's less than 1, which is, what's another word for a gain which is less than 1? I didn't go up, so what happened? What happened to my money? Did I... I lost money, okay? I start with 1,000, I end up with 250. I've lost money. So we can also say that's a loss in that system. And a way to quantify that loss would be a factor of four. I start with 1,000, 
I end up with 250, I'd say that's a loss by a factor of four. I've got four times less than what I started with. So in fact, the gain, the loss is an inverse of the gain. My gain in that system was 0 0.25, 1 over 4. My loss was 4, just the inverse. So with any system, we can talk about the gain and the loss of the system. And it's especially used in communication systems. For example, I transmit a signal from my laptop to the access point. That signal has some strength. And we said yesterday, with attenuation, the signal gets weaker. By how much weaker? Or another thing we say, we lose power. We start with some power, the signal gets weaker, we end up with some received power, so we've lost some power. We often want to measure how much we lose. Similar, sometimes we have an amplifier. In my audio system, I talk, so I produce audio at one output, it goes through the microphone to the amplifier, which increases the signal output, so what you hear by the speakers is louder than what I'm, is coming out of my mouth. So there's a gain in that system. So we want to quantify the gain and loss of communication systems. So think simply, the gain is a multiplier. Uh, we can express that with some picture and, and simple equation. Let's try. Uh, what do we start with? We have a system. Um, I'll just represent as a box. And we have some input. Something comes in and something comes out. And with communication systems, we often care about power. I transmit my signal with some power level. My audio system has some power output. Power usually measured in watts. So I'll say the input to my system is some power level, P in. And the output, P out, P for power. So here's my system. I take some input power into my system and it does something and I get some output power. Well the gain of that system is the ratio of the output divided by the input. So we can say the gain, let's say G, is P out divided by P in. Same as our money example. I started with 1,000 baht, I end up with 2,000 baht, the gain is 2. 2,000 divided by 1. I have, or in, in watts, for example, I have a communication system or a, maybe uh, an audio system. My input is 1 watt, it feeds into the amplifier. <coughs> The amplifier has a gain of 2, so therefore the output of that amplifier, P out, will be 2 watts. So an example. This is the input, 1 watt. This is out, P out is 2 watts. We'd say the gain of that audio system is 2. There's no units on the gain. It's unitless. It's a factor, two times larger. The output is two times larger than the input. The loss is the inverse of the gain. So we can write a general equation. So another way, so we can also talk about the loss, L. And simply is the P in divided by P out. Sorry. So P, uh, yeah, P in divided by P out. In this case, we could say the gain is 2, the loss is 1 half. It means the same, just the inverse of each other. I transmit, using my laptop to the wireless access point, I transmit a signal. That signal, think of some sinusoid, it has some magnitude, some signal strength. 
we can measure that in, as a power level. And let's say I measure the output signal from my laptop it to be one milli, 100 milliwatts. It's 100 milliwatts. A typical value of a wireless transmitter. It transmits power at 100 milliwatts. It propagates across the, the air. It loses strength across distance. It attenuates. And let's say I measure it at the receiver, and the measured value at the receiver is one microwatt. What's the loss? That's 100 milliwatts, not 160. 100 milliwatts in the transmit power. We lose signal strength across the distance. That's something we cannot avoid. It attenuates. And the received power is one micro. This is mu here, or u, one microwatt. What's the loss factor in this case? So be careful with the prefixes, milli and microwatts. But otherwise, loss, think of the input divided by the output. Anyone? How many, how many microwatts in one milliwatt? Micro, milli, remember, is 10 to the minus 3. Micro, 10 to the minus 6. So there's 1,000, or 10 to the power of 3, microwatts in one milliwatt. 1,000 microwatts in one milliwatt. Therefore, in 100 milliwatts, there would be 100,000 microwatts. Or... If you want to do the maths, you just 100 by 10 to the minus 3 divided by 1 by 10 to the minus 6. And the answer, 100,000. No units. The loss factor is 100,000. That is, I transmit my signal at this level it's reduced by a factor of 100,000 by the time it's received. Any questions about gain or loss? We haven't got to decibels yet, but we will next. Gain, the factor we increase. Loss, the factor we reduce by. And they're the inverse of each other in these absolute values. So we can use these values, gain and loss. But in practice, especially when we have very large values, very large loss values, uh, or very small values, and when we want to perform operations on those values, it sometimes helps to convert them into a different scale. And that scale is decibels. So a decibel is also a measure of the ratio of two levels two power levels. The gain is one power level divided by another. The general formula for a decibel uh, for the gain, we can express the gain in dB decibels. And the general formula 10 times log in base 10 of the gain in the absolute value. This is dB, decibels. That is, if we know the gain that we've calculated above the absolute value, like 2, or a loss of 100,000, to convert it into the decibel form, we take the logarithm in base 10 of that value and multiply by 10 and we get the gain in dB. What we're actually going through is in some of your one of your handouts toward the start of your uh, lecture notes, the definitions, concepts, acronyms, prefixes, logarithms. 
decibels and signal strength. So you have also have some of it in your notes. This equation. The gain in dB is 10 times log in base 10 of P out divided by P in. Where in my notes I've written P out divided by P in is just G. So note there's a different subscript. G, I say, is the absolute value. G subscript dB is the gain in decibels. Think of it as just a, a different uh, scale. The same can be said for loss. The loss in dB is 10 log base 10 of the loss, the absolute value. So dB is not a unit here. It's still, when we say 10 dB, 20 dB, it's still talking about a ratio of two different levels. But it's just on a different scale than our normal uh, absolute factor. And we take a logarithm, and the properties of logarithms often help with, if we have numbers in dB, then we can perform operations easier than if they're in the absolute value. And that's one of the advantages of using decibels. Also, when we have very large numbers, this isn't too large, but 100,000, what's the loss in dB for 100,000? Calculate the loss in decibels. If L is 100,000, the loss in decibels, log base 10 of 100,000, which is, okay, this is stuff you did five years ago, logarithms. What's the log of, let's start simple, loss, what's the log of 10? One. What's the log of 100? What's the log of 1,000? Log of 10,000. Four. The log of 100,000. Five. Okay. Log, we're using base 10 here. 100,000 is 10 to the power of 5. The log of 100,000 is 5. Multiply by 10, we get 50 dB. L equals 100,000 is the same as 50 dB, 50 decibels. Just the same value, but in using a different scale here. What about the gain of 2? How many dB? Approximately. The gain of 2? Well, you may need your calculator. You don't need that. That's later. With a gain of 2, the log of 2 is 0 0.3, approximately, times by 10, about 3, 3.01 in this case. So the, a gain of 2 is uh, equivalent to 3 decibels, 3 dB. So a gain of 2, I won't write it down, 3 dB. And that's actually one useful one to remember, because a gain of 2 is quite common. Or uh, A gain of 2 is 3 dB means if we double something, it's a 3 dB increase. write it down. A gain of 2, we've got 3 dB, about 3 dB. What's a gain of 4? How many dB? 
course, you can use your calculator, but maybe you'll find that it's just double or another 3 dB. You can check. And a gain of 6? Anyone want to, get, want to guess? Oh, sorry, a gain of 8. A gain of 8. Doubling each time is a 3 dB increase. So from 2 to 4 is doubled. It's a gain, an extra gain of 3 dB. From 4 to 8, if the gain was 8, it would be 9 dB, 16, 12 dB. You just keep adding 3. That's one of the properties of logarithms. It, when we multiply in the absolute values, it's a, we can add when we're using the decibels, the logarithmic values. And that property of the log of A times B is equal to the log of A plus the log of B. All right, so that's some that we may see in practice that, okay, 3 dB. 6 dB is a, a factor of 2 times 2, or 4. 9 dB, factor of 8. 12 dB, 16, and so on. I don't ask you to remember them, but we'll see them in a moment. 3 dB. What's the loss? Loss in dB. A gain of 2 is a loss of what? Forget about decibels. If I have a gain of 2, I can also say that's a loss of if one half is the inverse. Okay, I start uh, back to my money I, from 1,000 to 2,000 baht is a gain of 2 or from 1,000 1, down to 500 is a loss of 2 or a gain of a half. They are the inverse of each other. So a gain of 2 is a loss of a half but in dB, a gain of 3 dB is the loss of... Now calculate. So the loss is 0.5. Use our same equation. Let's try. So the log, sorry, log of 0 0.5 times 10. Minus 3 dB. Again, due to the properties of logarithms, you will see that a gain of 3 dB is the same as a loss of minus 3 dB. Approximately. A gain of 6 dB is the same as a loss of minus 6 dB. Okay. In, when we're using the absolute values, gain and loss are inverses of each other. When we're using decibels, it's the negative of each other. So 6 dB or minus 6 dB. And again, that's much easier when you're dealing with dB. Uh, you can quickly convert from uh, gain to loss. Just add, uh, change the sign of that uh, number. If I have a gain of uh, 24 dB, what's the absolute value? A gain of 24 dB. We're going to need. I'm do, we're going to need this value later. That's why I want to calculate now. Calculate the the absolute value.
What's the answer? If our gain is 24 dB, that is the same as... Well, 24 dB, we have the value in dB. 24 equals 10 times log of the absolute value. So just solve for this value. 24 equals 10 log something, which means if we divide by 10, 2.4 equals 10 log something. 2.4 equals 10 log something, therefore something equals what? 10 to the power of 2.4. And you need your calculator. I've done it before. It's about 251. Just one example of going the opposite direction. So there's a lesson online for those who can't remember logarithms and exponentials. We're not going to teach them in this course because you learned them many years ago. But go and refresh your memory on some, especially some of the properties of logarithms because they come useful when we do calculations uh, and how to quickly solve them. With that said, you can use your calculator in the exam, but sometimes you need to do something quick in your head. A gain of 251 is also a gain of 24 dB. A difference of 3 dB is a factor of 2. If I go from 3 dB to 6 dB, it's a 2 times increase. If I go from 5 dB to 8 dB, it's a 2 times increase. So a difference of 3 dB is a factor of 2. That's a useful one to remember, because you often see it. We'll see an example of, or two examples of, of decibels. Any questions before we return back to our course, back to our signals? Of course, dB are used not just in communications, well, in, in, in many systems. Uh, our audio system, you talk about the characteristic of an amplifier and maybe measured in decibels. Uh, actually, I want one more example before we go to the lecture. Now we, let's go back to signals. Just a quick example. This is part of our lecture recorded yesterday, some audio a wave file which I've open, opened in an audio editor called Audacity and it shows the audio signal as a function of time. So we can see the magnitude varying over time, over uh, about two minutes of audio, two and a half minutes. Uh, nothing exciting there, we can zoom in. So it's just a measure of this so it's an example of a signal, in this case an audio signal. We can zoom in and see the details of that. Uh, so that's over a period of 10 milliseconds. We just see the, the oscillations of the magnitude of that signal. It doesn't look like a perfect sine wave, of course. Our real signals are much more complex than just adding two sine waves together, as we see here. Uh, it looks like some random variations, in fact. But in theory, what we can do is take this signal in the time domain and do analysis that splits it into a combination of many individual sine waves, sinusoids. And if we then look at each of those sine, sine waves and look at their frequency, we can inspect that signal in the frequency domain. So we can look at the, the spectrum, the bandwidth of the signal, uh, and plot the signal in the frequency domain. This software does it for us. By, if I zoom out, select all of this, I can do some analysis and plot the spectrum, which is in fact produce a plot of this signal in the frequency domain. 
Remember, we saw plots like very simple ones with some impulses at particular frequencies. But more complex signals have a, a wide range of frequencies, not just two. This one contains many frequencies. So when I plot the spectrum, it's going to produce a plot like this, but we will see that there are many, many impulses. And there they are. Okay. In fact, there's so many that it combines them, which is the common way to, to view it. That is, this is the frequency on the axis, uh, on this axis, and this is the peak amplitude. So approximately at the frequency of around 500 hertz, so 0 to 1000 hertz, around 500 hertz, this peak amplitude is the highest. That is, we say that the signal is strongest in these frequencies. We see it's the highest here. In this range of frequencies, from 1,000 up to 2,000, it's much weaker. And there's, in that audio, there's also some frequencies in the, up to 15,000, 20,000 hertz. But their magnitude is much smaller. How much smaller? And this is where dB come in. It's commonly used in, in such a plot. Be careful. This is in decibels. And we see the difference between here and here is 6 dB. A difference of 3 dB is a factor of 2. A difference of 6 dB is a factor of 4. What that tells us is the magnitude of the signal here versus here this one is about four times smaller. So if we drew it, say, one component at the top, and then at this point it's four times smaller, or one quarter of the size. Another 6 dB down is another four times smaller. That is, the signals here are 16 times smaller than these ones, the magnitude. So even though these look about the same or close to hi in height to here because it's a scale in decibels these are much weaker than here and these are you know, hundreds of times weaker than the, the signals up to 1000 hertz so the audio from yesterday the main components are from 0 up to 1000 hertz there are some other weaker components in uh, as we increase the spectrum. These are very, very weak, in fact. So there's one example where we see decibels. And a much more complex signal in that it's not just two or three sine components, it's a combination of many components, each at different frequencies. Let's try and finish this topic on capacity. So we just introduced decibels, given a quick example of a signal. And now let's look at, given a communications channel with some characteristics, I want to know how fast I can send bits across it. So I have a link. Maybe I know its bandwidth the range of frequencies I can send through that link, then given the bandwidth and other characteristics of that link, I'd like to know how fast can I send bits? What data rate can I achieve? What's the capacity of that channel? Channel capacity, the maximum data rate at which data can be transmitted across a, a given communication channel or link. And we'll see some equations, and I will use data rate and capacity to mean the same thing. So in the equations, we'll see the data rate, which I'd prefer to call it, but it's expressed as C, meaning capacity. And it's measured in bits per second. Because as computer professionals, we care about data rate in terms of bits per second. But 
the physical characteristics of the link and the signal sent through it, we understand the bandwidth of the signals sent through that channel. What range of frequencies can we send? Some other things that we would need to consider, what if there's noise? What if there's some background noise or other transmitters? Does that impact upon our data rate? And we'll see some different, there's a couple of other uh, factors as well. So yesterday, yeah, yesterday we saw a very simple example with a signal where we had some bandwidth of, I don't know, 4 hertz, and we calculated a data rate of 4 bits per second. We saw some relationship between data rate and bandwidth. People have done more analysis and come up with theoretical models that relate bandwidth and data rate. And they are useful to estimate, given a particular bandwidth, how fast can I send data. And two models, which are the main ones, which we'll go through, are called the Nyquist capacity model and the Shannon capacity model, developed mainly by Mr. Nyquist and Mr. Shannon. Okay. And they make different assumptions. Let's go through them. And you may have heard of Nyquist in other, maybe, computer hardware topics, maybe not. We'll see him come up. And Shannon. Uh, Shannon developed this quite famous model, and he did other things like digital circuits and cryptography. Uh, his name comes up as doing some uh, important things um, in many fields of communications and, and networks. First, Nyquist capacity. Nyquist come up with a model that relates bandwidth to data rate, or bandwidth to capacity, assuming there's no noise. And we said yesterday there's always noise. But to keep things simple, if there was no noise, no background noise, no other transmitters, Nyquist come up with an equation given here. The capacity of the channel in bits per second is two times the bandwidth of that channel, bandwidth measured in hertz, times by log in base 2 of some value m. m is the number of levels in the signal being sent. So we'll need to explain that. We'll explain what m is and then with some examples and then come back to how we can use this equation. But this is the Nyquist capacity equation. If we know the bandwidth and we know this value m, we can calculate the Nyquist capacity of our channel. What is M? M is, as I said, the number of levels in our signal. Up until now we've used two levels in our signals to represent bits. Let's draw some examples. You've seen some before. We had a very simple example yesterday where I drew, or in the past. We said that if we think of a simple sine wave, we could use the low portion to represent one bit and the high portion to represent another bit. So if I had a sequence of bits to send, like uh, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, then I could draw, use uh, to represent 0, low for 1, high, the second one high, 0 is low, and the fifth bit high. We saw some examples like that yesterday where we said in a very simple scheme, when I have a bit 0 transmitted at a low level, when I have a bit 1, transmit at a high level. But we, our signal doesn't have to be a simple sinusoid, it can be a combination, so it can be much more complex. But that's a scheme which says each bit maps to one level. There are two different levels in this scheme, high and low. High and low. Okay. Let's draw it as a square wave. All right. I'll draw a square wave because it's easier for me to draw and a larger sequence of bits. 
um, let's say I have 10 bits. Let's extend. 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, uh, 1, 10 bits, okay? Just some random bits. Then let's use this scheme low level for bit 0, high level for bit 1. And draw a signal, but in this case I'll draw it using a square wave. Zero, we start with low. And we maintain that level for some fixed period of time. And then a bit one, we go to high. And a second bit, one, we maintain high. And down to zero, or low. Then we've got a bit one, and a second bit one. Then two zeros and in fact two ones to finish with. So that red signal is one way to represent those ten bits where the, the period for each, let's say, signal element is this. Zero, one, one, zero, one, one, zero, zero, one, one. Okay? Again, this signal has two levels. and we can describe them, and I'll write them on the board so that we can recall them. The scheme here was bit 0, low. Bit 1, high. Two levels, so M is 2 in this case. Now let's do a different scheme. We don't have to just be limited to low and high. Let's do something where we map two bits to one of four levels. We'll look in pairs of bits. And I'll design a scheme that says if I have two bits zero zero, then I'll produce a signal which is, let's say, very low. Zero one, so very low, let's say negative five. And 0, 1, just low, maybe minus 3. 1, 0, high, just plus 3. And 1, 1, very high. This is a different scheme for mapping bits to signals. There are four levels here. M equals 4. Let's try and draw that signal that we need to transmit to represent those 10 bits. Need some space. Actually, I want that to be black. Let's draw a green signal to represent those 10 bits where our bits gone. Uh, so, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, 0, 0, 1, 1. What we do now is we take two bits at a time. So the first two bits, 0, 1. Well, we're going to produce a signal which is low. And then the next two bits, 1, 0, will be a signal which is high. Try and draw the signal yourself. 
Well, I think it's quite easy. Uh, I don't want that. I made a mistake. The first portion of the signal here is our low signal, 0, 1. This is high, 1, 0. It's a positive value. The next two bits are 1, 1, correct? So very high. And then very low. And very high again. Low, zero, one. High, one, zero. Very high, one, one. Very low, zero, zero. Very high, one, one. The same 10 bits. If we receive this signal using this second scheme, we'd receive the same 10 bits. The important difference here, two different schemes for mapping bits to the signal levels. Which one's faster? The green one finishes the transmission of those bits in half the time as the red one, if everything else is the same, because for each, let's say, signal element, in the red one, we transmit one bit of information. With the green one, in the same time, two bits of information. So if we're doing everything at the same speed, we'd be sending twice as much information per second in this second scheme. We send our 10 bits in this period, whereas with the red one, we send 10 bits in double the period, twice as slow. which indicates that by increasing the number of levels that we have for our signal, we can increase the speed at which we send our bits, if everything else is the same. That is, we send the bits in shorter time. These are just two uh, made-up example schemes. In another topic, we'll see some realistic schemes, but the principle is the same. The more levels we have, the higher data rate we can achieve. The Nyquist capacity equation considers that. If M is the number of levels in the signal that you're using, and you know the bandwidth of your communications channel, then the data rate that you can achieve is two times the bandwidth log base two of the number of levels. From the equation, we see two quick things. If B increases, if the bandwidth is increased, then the capacity or data rate increases. More bandwidth, more data rate. Similar, increased M, more levels, higher data rate. Going from M equal to 2 to M equal to 4 will increase our data rate. Now let's apply Shannon capacity equation with a couple of quick examples. Uh, first example is here. The telephone system has a modem. So you have your computer connected to a modem. Think of the old dial-up modems, which then connects to the telephone line, and you send your data across that telephone network. The telephone system supports a bandwidth of 3,100 hertz. How fast can we send data? And in the initial case, assume we use a signal with just two levels. Okay, very simplistic, the simplest we can achieve. If M equals 2, what's the data rate? Quickly calculate using the Nyquist equation.
So we have Our bandwidth is 3,100 hertz. That's the typical, or that's a realistic bandwidth of a telephone link, your home telephone system. And in this case, to get started, let's assume the number of levels M of our signal that we use is 2. So using the Nyquist capacity equation, we can simply calculate the data rate or capacity. 2 times the bandwidth. times by log in base 2 of M. Log base 2 of 2 is 1 times by 3,100 times 2 is 6,200. And here's a, well, a trick or a, a, a rule. The bandwidth is measured in hertz. So 2 times 3,100 hertz. Capacity is measured in bits per second. So the answer is given in bits per second, 6,200 bits per second. So with a normal home telephone line, which supports a bandwidth of 3,100 hertz, if I use a simple signal with just two levels, the fastest I can send data, assuming there's no noise, is 6,200 bits per second. Anyone who remembers the dial-up modems? Anyone have a dial-up modem still? No? Anyone remember using them? Before the ADSL modems, you had a dial-up modem which uh, it dialed into the ISP before you started using the internet and made that funny noise and then connected. Anyone had one? Used one? Everyone? Most people? Uh, how fast? Faster than 6,200 bits per second? Can you remember the speeds of the dial-up modems? 56 kilobits per second. That was about the highest speed that we got. Some, the original ones are around 28 kilobits per second, but the latest ones, 56 kilobits per second. It, those modems use the telephone network, which use a bandwidth of 3,100 hertz. How can we achieve 56 kilobits per second when we're limited in bandwidth? How do you think the modem worked? What that modem did was took your bits from your computer and sent a signal. The bandwidth of that signal was 3,100 hertz. What else did the modem do? related to what we see here. It increases the levels. It must do because, remember this is a capacity. Nyquist equation tells us if we have 3,100 hertz and if the number of levels is 2, you cannot send faster than 6,200 bits per second. It's a capacity, the upper limit. There's no way in the world that you can send faster. Okay? That's the way to interpret this Nyquist capacity. In fact, in practice, you'd send slower because there's noise and other factors. So it's the upper limit. But we just said that our dial-up modems, which I'm telling you use the same bandwidth, we think they can achieve 56,000 bits per second. So to do that, our modem must use a signal with more than two levels. How many levels? Find the solution. So if we, we know from experience that the capacity is about 56,000 bits per second, same bandwidth, then how many levels did the signal contain? Try and solve that. If we have 56,000 bits per second as the capacity bandwidth of 3,100, what's M?
So basically, you, you use the same equation but work backwards. Anyone find an answer? Find M. To the closest power of two. Okay, it doesn't have to, to the closest power of two is the what you need. Don't have an answer yet. bandwidth is still 3,100 hertz, so B is still 3,100. Close? Good. Right, correct, correct approach. What did you get? Looks too big. I think your calculator is using log 10 but this is log in base 2. So by rearranging the equation we know, and we can write it, we get 56,000 the capacity equals 2 times the bandwidth, 3,100 times log base 2 of m. So we get, what, 6,200 here, take it to the other side, so 56,000 divided by 6,200 is about, some people will discover it as about 9. So 56,000 divided by 2 divided by 3,100, so it's approximately 9 equals log base 2 of m. Therefore m equals 512. Because 2 to the power of 9 is 512. That is, in your, those modems, the dial-up modems, we achieve 56 kilobits per second, the modem generated a signal didn't have two levels or four levels, it had 512 different levels. Each level mapped to nine different bits. So it could transmit a signal to carry that data at 56 kilobits per second. And, okay, any questions on the calculations? There's just some basic maths there. In practice, the number of levels is usually a power of two. Okay, so even though this is not exactly nine, 9.03 or, or whatever, uh, in practice, the implementation, because we're dealing with binary, zeros and ones, the number of levels is a power of two. Let's return to our equation. So, what can we say about some trade-offs that are identified from the Nyquist capacity? If we have a communications link, we know its bandwidth. We know the number of levels used in the signal we're transmitting. Then we can calculate the data rate for that link, the upper limit data rate. Under the assumption there's no noise. And we see if we increase the bandwidth, we increase the data rate. If we increase the number of levels, we increase the data rate. Yeah, that's direct from the equation. But some practical things. If we increase the number of levels, then it becomes harder and harder for the receiver, when it receives a signal, to map that signal back to the correct bits. So that's not captured in the equation, but especially in the case of noise, the more levels you use in the presence of noise, 
the larger the chance you'll get errors at the receiver. So there in fact is a practical limit to M. And in fact in the, the home modems, dial-up modems, the practical limit, we just calculated it, 512. Going larger to say 1024, uh, it wasn't uh, possible to implement the hardware to deal with that at that stage. So they looked at alternative techniques, ADSL for example. So Nyquist capacity says just increase M, keep going and you get higher data rate. But practice tells us that you can't make that too large because it makes the receiver very hard to implement. And in fact, in the presence of noise, you start to get many errors at the receiver. You send bits 011 and you start to receive 010. We get bit errors. So that's something to consider when calculating with Nyquist capacity. Well, in real life there is noise. Another guy, Shannon, come up with a different theoretical model, taking into account noise. So Shannon come up with a formula that says, if we know the bandwidth of a communications channel, irrespective of the number of levels, if we know something about the noise in that channel, in particular the noise relative to the received signal strength, then we can calculate the data rate of that channel. So we have a new concept here called the signal to noise ratio, SNR. It's the ratio of the received signal and the received noise. And we tried to do that, what, yesterday. When I talk, someone receives my signal, if other people start talking and the noise goes up, then what do we get? The signal to noise ratio, the noise goes up, the signal to noise ratio goes down. The more noise, the harder it is to receive, and the end result, the lower the data rate. So Shannon equated these three factors together. Bandwidth, received signal strength or signal power, and the noise, received noise. And we see from the equation, higher bandwidth, higher data rate, higher capacity. Increased signal power, so SNR goes up, increased data rate. That is, if we transmit at a higher power, the, receive will receive, the receiver will receive at a higher power and that gives us a higher data rate. And also, increased noise, more noise in the system, SNR goes down, so this goes down, data rate goes down. The more noise, the lower the data rate. So that's the relationship between those three factors. Increased bandwidth or signal power increases the data rate, good. Increase of the, the noise reduces the data rate, bad. And something that's not captured in this equation, but again is in uh, practice, if you do increase the bandwidth, according to this equation we increase the data rate, but it allows more noise in practice. Larger bandwidth signal or system, the more noise can come in. And the more noise, the lower the data rate. So there's in fact a, a practical trade-off there. You can't just keep making the bandwidth larger because it starts to make the noise larger when everything else is the same. And you can't just transmit at a higher power all the time because the, the higher you transmit, you start to get interference from other sources. Uh, for example, if I want to communicate to you clearly, if there's other people talking, if I keep talking louder and louder or if I keep increasing the amplifier output, the, the sound level, According to this, it'll be easier to hear, but I start interfering with other classrooms, for example. The classrooms downstairs will start to receive my signal, causing noise for their system. So there are some practical trade-offs to consider uh, between increasing bandwidth and, and power level. So this is another formula to tell us Given some characteristics of a communication system, how fast can we send bits? 
Same with Nyquist. This is a theoretical capacity. In practice, there are limitations that mean we cannot actually achieve this capacity. We can get close, but you will not go above it. It's a capacity. And in fact, practice, you will not actually get the exact same value in realistic conditions. But it gives us a good indicator of how fast we can send. Let's give an example, but before we do that, B, easy. If we know the bandwidth, we plug it in here. SNR is the signal power divided by the, or the, think of the received signal power divided by the received noise power. In practice, we usually need to measure the noise. We may not know in advance. Uh, we could guess what it could be. So sometimes the SNR, this ratio of the two, may be given for a particular channel. Let's solve this one in two parts, two steps. So we have a communications channel, has a spectrum of between 3 megahertz and 4 megahertz. That is, it contains frequencies from 3 up to 4 megahertz. We've, we know the characteristics of that channel that when we transmit a signal and we measure the noise, the ratio between signal to noise is 24 decibels. Forget about the, the question here. First answer, what capacity can we achieve in that channel using the Shannon capacity equation? We know the spectrum, we know the signal to noise ratio in dB. What capacity can we achieve? Try and calculate that. And the hint, which makes it a little bit harder, this equation, SNR, is not measured in dB. It is the absolute value. So the, this question gives you SNR measured in decibels. You need to convert that back to the original absolute value and then plug it into this equation. Try over the next five minutes. So you, you use the Shannon capacity equation, but you need to find B and SNR in the right, or the right values for them. So, hint, one thing not to do, do not put 24 here, it's wrong. 24 dB, you need to convert it to the, the absolute value for signal to noise ratio. So go back to your knowledge of decibels. You know the dB value, you need to know the absolute value. And then you can insert the absolute value here where we have SNR.
What's B? Anyone help me? What's the bandwidth of our channel? What, one megahertz. The spectrum is said from three megahertz up to four megahertz, so the width is one megahertz. What is SNR is your next step. You know it in dB, convert it back to the absolute value. And we did it before. In, in, the, intro, in the examples of dB, that's when I did the, the calculation. That's why I did it in the, in the first example, because I knew we'd need it. Anyone remember the answer? What do we calculate? Someone's got it, 251. SNR is 251. Ten to the power of two point four. Now you can use the Shannon capacity equation. Now you can just plug the values into the capacity equation, which is B times log base 2 of 1 plus S and R. B, 1 by 10 to the power of 6 hertz, 1 million hertz, 1 megahertz, so be careful here. Log base 2 of 1 plus 251. That is log of 252. Anyone get an answer? What, what is it? The final answer? Eight. About correct. Log of 252 is about eight. Log base two of 256 is exactly eight. So log of 252 is a little bit less than eight, 7.9 something. I don't know. But I'll assume that log base two of 252 is close enough to eight. So therefore our capacity is about 8 by 10 to the power of 6. Bits per second. Or 8 megabits per second. And then return to the original question. How many signal levels are required to achieve this capacity? If we want to get 8 megabits per second, we know the bandwidth is 1 megahertz. Now use the Nyquist equation to determine M. 
how many signal levels we need. So in fact, this is a combination of the two. To get 8 megabits per second with 1 megahertz bandwidth, M would need to be what? So recall now the other equation. Capacity equals 2 times B log base 2 of M. We know C, 8 megabits per second. We know B, 1 megahertz. Find M. have M. Correct. Well done. <coughs> so what's M? 16. Good. Okay. Some people are on the right track. So just some simple rearrangements of that Nyquist equation. Capacity is 8 megabits per second equals 2 times 1 megahertz, 2 times 1 million, log base 2 of m. So 8 million equals 2 million log m, which means log m must equal 4 which means M must equal 16. It's log base 2. If we wanted to achieve this capacity of 8 megabits per second, in theory, we'd need to use a signal with at least 16 levels. We could use more, but less than 16 would, according to Nyquist's capacity, would not get us to 8 megabits per second. Let's summarize. I'll return to that in a moment. Nyquist and Shannon capacity are theoretical models for determining the data rate, the capacity of a link, given the bandwidth and other characteristics. Nyquist assumes there's no noise, makes an assumption so it's simple to calculate. In reality, there's always noise. It depends upon the number of levels in our signal that we transmit. Shannon assumes that there's noise, and therefore the data, the data rate, the capacity, depends upon how much noise, especially how much noise relative to how much signal do we receive, the real signal. So when someone transmits, I receive the, re the signal. How much noise is there relative to that? The more noise, the lower the signal to noise ratio and the lower the data rate. Both of them are theoretical models that we, can, we cannot achieve in practice, but we can get close. That is, we can build systems, communication links, which approach the Shannon capacity. So if we know some bandwidth and signal to noise ratio, we can implement the hardware to transmit signals which get close to the Shannon capacity. Uh, but because of practical limitations, not exactly reach the capacity. And let's stop there. Okay, so what you'll do 